We shall begin by formalising exactly what we mean by a graph, because there are some ambiguities that we need to make clear. Like, do we allow loops? So we define a graph to be an ordered pair of two sets. The first set is a set of vertices, so these are our nodes, and the second set is a set of edges. Now, we define an edge to be a set of two distinct vertices. Doing it this way means that given any two distinct nodes, there could possibly be an edge between them. But requiring the vertices to be distinct means we can't have loops. And since the order of elements in a set doesn't matter, this means we're not giving preference to either vertex. So there's no concept of direction or flow assigned to an edge. But these are things which can be useful, but you need to make a special definition to work with them. By defining the edge set as a set, it means you can't have multiple edges between two given nodes because duplicates in a set just get swallowed up. Finally, it's very important to note that in graph theory, we always assume the graph has a finite number of vertices unless stated otherwise. This allows us to use a very powerful technique, which is being greedy, which we'll see in action soon. But to do this, the graph must be finite. So now we've laid down exactly what we mean by a graph, it's time to build some intuition and meet some of the most common examples we will meet all the time in graph theory. Boss. First, I'll define what it means to say a graph itself is a path, and then what it means to say that a graph contains a path between two of its vertices. So, if a graph has n nodes, and they can be ordered, one to n, such that the edges of the graph are precisely the set of consecutive pairs, so an edge between 1 and 2, an edge between 2 and 3, up to an edge between n minus 1 and n, then this graph we call Pn, the path on n vertices. So here, this is P5 and we define this to be of length 4. And in general, Pn has length n minus 1. So be careful not to read the n in Pn as its length. Rather, it's the number of vertices in the path, which is always one more than its length. Now consider any graph and look at two vertices in that graph. To say that there is a path between them in the graph means that there is a Pn between them in the graph for some n. That is, n distinct vertices that are joined by edges, as in the path. It's really important that the vertices on this journey are distinct. So here's a path. But if the vertices don't have to be distinct, then we could have also taken this path. But by weakening the requirement that the vertices are distinct, what happens is you allow for these extra loops that start and end on the path. But we exclude these because they're just a nuisance. We'll see that all the paths between two different points give us a really useful way to talk about how well connected those two points are. But intuitively, you can see that whether or not we choose to include this loop on the path, it's not contributing anymore to how well connected these two vertices are. And in practice, it just introduces more clutter and makes things difficult to work with. So we rule them out from the definition of paths, but we call a sequence like this with repeated vertices a walk between two points. And intuitively, it's quite clear that if there's a walk between two points, then that walk will contain a path in it. But showing this is not so obvious, and you can do it by this powerful method I mentioned earlier of being greedy and taking what you want. That's on the problem sheet. Like paths, cycles are also very intuitive, and their definition is very similar. An n cycle is a graph on n vertices, and these vertices can be ordered 1, 2, 3, up to n, such that the edges are the sets of consecutive pairs of vertices, like in a path. But the difference is now, however, is that there's a wraparound, and node n is joined to node 1. So this is a 5 cycle, C5, and in general, the cycle with n vertices we call Cn, and now we say this has length n. Something we'll see a lot coming up that we need to be aware of is that properties of cycles often depend on whether the number of vertices in the cycle is odd or even, so it's standard convention to just call these odd or even cycles. Complete graphs are edge maximal. Between every pair of vertices, there's an edge. If the graph has n vertices, we call it Kn. So here's K5. This is the largest density of edges you can get in the graph. And the total number of edges in Kn is n choose 2. Because for an edge, you have to choose two nodes. There's n choices for the first, then n minus 1 for the second. But the order of the vertices doesn't matter, so you divide that by 2. You might have a feeling of, so what? It doesn't feel very intricate, it's just every possible edge is present. Well, later in the course in multiple settings, we'll study the question of when does a graph have to contain a complete graph in it? And we'll then go on and extend this to the infinite setting and to do some really interesting consequences in number theory.
take a look at this graph. Do you notice anything? <laughs> no, me neither. It's a complete mess. But this is good to see because every graph we've seen so far has had a very specific structure and also with not that many nodes. So it's good to keep our visual intuition in check and remember that graphs can have potentially of the order of n squared edges and this gets large very quickly. This is why we hunt for structure that makes graphs easier to work with. As we move these points around, you can see a certain kind of structure emerging. The vertices have been split into two groups such that every single edge goes between the two groups. The graphs whose vertices can be split up into two such groups in this way are called bipartite. We will prove some really useful results concerning the graphs that have this bipartite structure, but first it would be really nice if we have a way to figure out if a given graph is bipartite, because with the mess we started with, it's not at all obvious. It turns out that there is a nice way to test this, and we're going to prove this now. The way we can test whether or not a graph is bipartite becomes clear if we consider what happens with cycles. If a cycle is even, like this one, then we can just walk around the cycle and alternate which vertex class we put the current vertex in. Once we're done, you can see that any edge goes between the vertex classes A and B. But what happens with odd cycles? Certainly, if we do the same here, this won't work, but this also shows that there is no possible way of separating the vertices of an odd cycle, because choose a vertex, then its neighbour has to be in the alternate class, then its neighbour has to be in the alternate class, etc, etc. But because it's odd, we'll end up with an edge between two vertices in the same class. So we've shown that a cycle is bipartite if, and only if, it's an even cycle. But notice now that it's immediate that if a given graph is bipartite, then it cannot contain an odd cycle, because the bipartition of the main graph restricts the one on the odd cycle. But we've shown this can't happen. The really nice converse result is that if a graph is free of odd cycles, it doesn't contain any, then it is guaranteed to be bipartite. And the proof of this direction will be where we start episode 2, but if you want to try it yourself, then I'll walk you through it on the problem sheet.